पब्लिक स्पीकिंग डॉक्टर्स प्रैक्टिसेस पार्ट थ्री डॉक्टर ऑफ एस रिस्पॉन्स वी थियोरी द प्रिंसिपल ऑफ प्लेन ब्लैंड मैन alternatively we can say theory doctrine principles canons of public speaking we have observed the application of s response doctrine with theory plain blunt man principle in mark antony's oration which he gave in on the funeral of caesar Mark Antony's speech. We can refer for analysis. He says that the noble Brutus has told you that Caesar was ambitious, and this was a grievous fault. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft bitter with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus has told you that Caesar was ambitious, and if it was so, it was a grievous fault. And grievously had Caesar answered it. Now this is the S response theory. He wants to concede grounds that if he was ambitious, it was a grievous fault. He is conceding grounds because the people of Rome had been convinced that Caesar was ambitious and Rome was in danger, and so he adopted son Brutus. Cassius and the conspirators had killed him. It was in the interest of Rome that he he was killed. So he uses the yes response theory and conceding grab documents, saying that if he was ambitious, if it were so, if it was a grievous fault, and grievously has Caesar wept, uh, uh, has Caesar answered it. Here, under the leave of Brutus and the honourable men, the rest of them, I come here to speak at Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honourable man. He had brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? Now he starts changing his trend. He had brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor had cried, Caesar had wept. Ambition should be made of external stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honourable man. You all did see that on Lupercal, I thrice presented him the kingly crown, which he thrice did refuse. He says, "You all did see." Now he takes the participation of the people along with him. You all did see. Now here is the application of V theory. You all did see. I but I you all did see that on Lupercal I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he thrice did refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And sure, he is an honourable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him worse, not without cause. Here he is trying to remind them of something which they have forgotten. So, if we want to state some truth and to convince the people, we must state that truth as something forgotten by the people. We should not state as as a new fact that I am telling that this fact is there. We should remind them that you yourself have forgotten it, and I am simply reminding it. So he says, "You all did see that on Lupercal. I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he thrice did refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he is a he was ambitious, and sure he is an honourable man. I speak not to disprove of what Brutus says, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him was not without cause. What cause withholds you that then?" To mourn for him, O judgment! Thou wilt fret to Brutus' beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me; my heart is in the coffin there, Miss Caesar. I must pause till it comes back to me. Then Caesar, then Mark Antony keeps quiet for a few moments. 
then again, again, public calls him that yes, you continue. But yesterday the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now he lies there and none so poor to do him reverence. O oh, masters, if I were to dispose to still your mind and hearts to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong. Then he says, here is a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it and it's closed it. Then he mentions to the parchment and then he later on uh, shows them the wounds of the Caesar and reads out the will. Then he says, it is not met you know how Caesar loved you. You are not oats, you are not stones, but men. And being men, hearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you, it will make you mad. It's good you know not that you are his heirs. Now, any speech to be successful <coughs> must have reason and emotion. Mark Antony here yeah, is blending reason and emotion in this speech. This is uh, written by Shakespeare. It's an immortal speech. So it's a blending of reason and emotion. It is essential to persuade the people. Then he says, if you have tears, prepare to shed them down. You all do know this mantle. I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on. It was a summer evening in his tent. That day he overcome the nervy. Then he later says, it points out that these wounds are most unkinded wounds. And then he says, I am no orator as Brutus is. You all do know I am a plain blunt man. Here come I to speak in Caesar's funeral under leave of Brutus and the honorable man. Then he says, I have neither wit nor words nor worth, action nor utterance nor the power of speech. To stir men's blood. I am no orator as Bootus is. But as you know, me all, a plain blunt man. It's a plain blunt man technique. He says, I am no orator as Bootus is, but I am a plain blunt man. I am making a plain talk. And then he says further, then, and there were, and would you ruffle up your spirit and put a tongue in every wound of the Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to mutiny? Now he is turning the tables against the Brutus and Cassius and he had left you all his property to the people of, of the room, his private arbors, new planted orchards and he had left them to you and to your heirs forever common pleasure to walk abro abroad and recreate yourself. Here was a Caesar when comes such another. And then he says, then citizens get enraged, excited, and they say <coughs> that we should take revenge. And then the mob chases the conspirators and punishes them and kills them. So here in this speech of Mark Antony, which was written by William Shakespeare, there are three theories. One is V theory, another is plain blunt man's theory, another is to remind so, some, if something new is being presented as an evidence to remind that it is something old that they have forgotten. In the in another speech where Lincoln addressed is at Gettysburg Cemetery, he has used the term what we say here, people will little note what we say here, but people will little note not long remember what we say here. But they will never forget what these soldiers have done. They have dedicated their life for a great cause. The world will little note not long remember what we say here. But it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living. Rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. So we have discussed three, uh, three theories. One is yes response doctrine uh, used by Mark Antony to win over the opposition. Then V theory, taking them together. Then plain blunt theory in the end, saying that I am no orator as Brutus is. 
and in the Gettysburg Address, uh, there is a V theory. In a court case, Lincoln has used reason and emotion. And he won the case. This was a case of a uh, widow of a soldier who had died in war. But the pension agent took half the her pension and that person, that, that lady came to Abraham Lincoln to file a suit against the pension agent who has unscrupulously taken half of the pension amount and there he uses uh, the principle of reason and emotion although the facts, facts he uses but the principle of reason and emotion and wins the case ultimately. Churchill had a great vision he was always inspired by the future because he has written uh, he's in, in his biography of Nobel Prize winners it is written that he's always thought of 1000 years ahead in his vision he thought he was inspired by a future what will historians think a thousand years ahead then he was drawing his strength from the past he said a nation rising on it on its ancient vigor can save the civilization so he believed that a nation can rise on its ancient wisdom or ancient glory if you remind them of an ancient glory they will develop self-confidence and rise and restore their civilization and go ahead and also is inspired by the future vision what will historians think in the future and then there is a principle that we should act in the living present so all these things future a vision for future inspiration from the past and acting in the present all these factors are necessary for those honorable persons who say forget the past forget the future remember the present Churchill's wisdom may be relevant. Therefore, our dear Amrita Saputraha, children of immortality, every moment of our life is the finest hour. Every moment of our life is the finest hour. The posterity will inherit your glory. Churchill wrote his speeches in epigrams, sutratmak, in lapidary style, sutraru that appear like poetry carved on stone. These epigrams had his self-confidence, power, wisdom condensed in them. For instance, he wrote, in war, resolution, in defeat, defiance, in victory, magnanimity, in peace, goodwill. We can also develop our own epigrams for a speech, for example, in adversity, optimism, in a struggle, persistence. In a speech, be elegant and graceful. Leave no chance for re repentance. So as a student of public speaking, effective speaking or oratory, we must do some exercise, some research work and homework. And this is the one of the points where we must do research, do some ex practice, that we should write our experiences in the by way of epigrams we should try to write our experiences the wisdom developed by the experiences into a form of maxims compress the entire argument in a maxim form then later on when the situation arises you can mention the maxim and explain it the great persons have never complained for instance the great persons have never complained of lack of opportunity because Rising in ad adversities, they become great. Now, this is a style of writing we must practice. That great persons have never complained of the lack of opportunities because rising in adversities, they became great. So, you know, beware of your inherent greatness as a micro replica of macro consciousness. The persons of wisdom have something to say, the others may just say something. Now this is by practice we will evolve this kind of phraseology. The persons of wisdom have something to say. 
the others may just say something. We need practice to develop this faculty of paradoxical reasoning. Every researcher and practitioner in the art and science of effective speaking must do some silent research work. This has been my sport, my game and experiment. I have been doing these practices and therefore I am sure that what I suggest will be followed by the listeners, by the viewers. I am confident. Now I am giving here six points for practice. One, practice writing thoughts and experiences condensed in maxims, axiomatic form. Whatever experiences or the wisdom we develop of ourselves by study, by experience in life, we must bring it down, condense it into a vis maxim. Two, write our thoughts in epigrams as Churchill used to write and speak. Epigrams such as in adversity, optimism, in a struggle, persistence, this is epigrammatic form, in war and resolution, in defeat, defiance, in victory, magnanimity, in peace, goodwill. In this form, try to write your experiences. This is, a, this is a practice which is very essential to become an effective speaker in life. Practice writing in paradoxes such as every challenge is an opportunity and every opportunity is a challenge. Now this is epigrammatic, this is paradoxical form of writing when both the sides of arguments are correct. Every challenge is an opportunity, every opportunity is a challenge. Both ways it is correct. This is paradoxical writing. We can also remember uh, the Kennedy's famous phrase, ask not what your country can do for you, ask yourself what you can do for your country, ask not what your country can do for you, ask yourself what you can do for your country. Now this form of writing must be practiced. Each one of us who are interested in becoming a great immortal speakers must develop this form of uh, phraseology by practice in our research room, in our home, and then in, incorporate it in our speeches. Fourth point, practice dialectical reasoning in the form of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Dialectical reasoning has three ingredients, thesis, ideal condition is thesis, worsening condition is antithesis. Then we come to a sub synthesis, sub arguments of synthesis and go ahead to achieve the state of thesis. Always remember, this is the fifth point, always remember you are the micro replica of macro consciousness. Arthat, aap sabashti chetna ke yatharthi vishti chetna hai. A micro replica of the macro consciousness. This will give you enormous confidence. This will remind you as to who you are. What is your ultimate source of power, ultimate source of knowledge. Also, sixth point. Also, that the personified all power has applied the tilaka vibhuti from leaping jnana yagya fire on your forehead. So, have ignited your minds and hearts that are aflame with fire of enthusiasm for the cause you speak for. So, whenever you speak for any cause or any subject, we must speak with enthusiasm, with fire in our minds and hearts, then alone it will be acceptable. If we are sincere, if we, if we are enthusiastic, the audience will feel enthusiastic and accept what you communicate.